Don't hire your friends. Okay, so let's introduce ourselves first. Um, I'm Kyle Babarad, Canary Consulting. Did you want to give your yeah. thing first? Yeah, I'm Bethany Ramsey. I'm the owner of Puff Apothecary. Uh, just a little background about me. I started around 2016 uh, as purely retail, and I was selling in other established businesses, just doing pop-ups. I did fairs. That was a way for me to get my feet wet into retail. Uh, then I got a space over at St. Clair Street uh, around 2017 um, and quickly realized that I needed to shift my business model as people kept asking me, um, I wish you could do my hair <laughs> when I had products. So I formed a lot of relationships with wonderful stylists and then I decided to open up a salon. Uh, and uh, then I transitioned to um, this renovating a space in the Oregon District. Uh, and we've been open, kind of reopened since, uh, 2020, I guess, or no, 20, uh, 2019, I don't know, it's kind of confusing with the, everything going on. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Cool, great. <laughs> and uh, Canary, uh, I started this, I acquired a business in 2016 that had been around for about 15 years, doing between $200,000 to $300,000 of revenue. We're in our fifth year now doing just about $2 million and uh, hoping to share some of how we helped that growth here today. So let's jump in. Um, we're sharing what worked for us. So you know, I run a professional services firm. I'm an actuary. This is an actuarial consulting business. We're in, in the insurance industry. And Bethany's running a natural hair salon. But we use a lot of the same techniques to get both of our businesses going to where they are now, where they're seeing a lot of organic growth. So three things we're going to share about building your first team, how to get more and better business, and how to get the most from your team, which is something that we're going through right now. Building your team. Do it yourself. Start solo. Did you want to? Yeah, I kind of mentioned that in my first intro. Just, I mean, I, it was just me. I was just in different people's businesses, selling my products. And I did that mostly because I really wanted to get to know um, the industry and to see, I mean, mine is very specific. I, I, everything is focused on natural hair and natural hair products. And I really wanted to see if that was viable as far as connecting with people purely on that level. So for me, it was definitely important for me to be at fairs, different inside different pit businesses, doing pop-ups. So everything was just by myself. And it was a lot of really great market research by doing it by myself. I think if I had someone else, I'd be a little distracted, so. Step two, and I'll elaborate on this one, become a salesperson. This made me really uncomfortable. And professional services, usually you have something you're really nerdy or really good at. But if you're going to grow best, and maybe being just on your own permanently is fine. But if you're really good at it, you're going to get more demand than what you can do on your own and you want to get a reliable sales channel going. So I literally just, there's a zillion sales books out there. Anybody who's starting a business has probably read any number of them. Any of them will do. Uh, they can be both motivational and give you tips, but calling people, emailing people, um, looking at job listings for things that seem to maybe be in your industry and just saying, hey, don't just outsource that. Uh, just becoming your own salesperson is step two of four of this process for building your team. Yeah. I was going to say it's really important to, to become a really good salesperson of your vision and your mission. The more practice you get as, as being a salesperson, is you're also like constantly repitching your idea to a million different people. So for me, it was not just customers, but also just getting staff to be like higher with me or, um, you know, stylists working with me because I had such a strong sense of what I was doing. I was able to tell them about what I was doing and get them like really hooked on to it. So. Okay. And here's the punchline of this. Post a job and don't hire your friends. And I think this is probably the hard part, um, at least for me, because when you're just starting on your own and you're looking for that number two, which you're probably going to have to spend all your money on if you're at that point where you're starting to develop some sales and maybe have your second person, you really want to hire your friends because you're going to get running faster. They're going to understand how you work. They're going to understand your culture as a single person. I Don't do that. And we're going to talk about why on the next slide here. So there's four reasons why. You shouldn't hire your friends when you get going, even though you may be scared and you want someone who really understands how you work. First, you're going to expand your network, which you're going to need for a lot of reasons. And you have a good. Yeah, no, definitely. For me, I, I really needed to connect with a lot of different audiences um, for you know natural hair specifically. Um, there's just a lot of different, you know, stages people are in and so I needed to get to know people outside of that and I didn't know a lot of people uh, at the time I'm from Dayton but I had moved back and so by not hiring maybe like family members that's also in the category of friends 
uh, I got to expand like, you know, who was living in Dayton now and who really needed my product, my services. Your team is gonna be on mission. I think this one's really important. This worked for both of us a lot. Your first hires, maybe not even your first or your second or your third, but if you get in the habit of just putting on a job listing and see who applies, I think first of all, you're gonna be surprised at a lot of the people who apply and what, the, what, it just, what it looks like, what the scene looks like. But the people who are coming to you, they don't know you, they don't have any reason to care about your business one way or another other than what you put in your mission. So they're here for your mission. They're not here for you. They're here for what you're doing and that's who you want on your team. Yeah, they're, they're not gonna give you that like pity support. You know, like some friends are like, oh, this is great. You're doing, a, you're doing this thing, you're doing this business. You know, they may kind of just be supporting you versus the, the, the actual vision of what you're doing. Like what you're, you know, understanding, you know, your services, your product. So um, I think it's really great. Plus, you know, you're getting people that, you know, they'll be able to repeat your mission back at, at, at you. You'll be surprised like from their angle and they'll have a lot of excellent perspective on it. So. Your team's gonna be no, more diverse. I was actually, this it may be self-evident, but I was actually shocked at the diversity of the resumes I was getting applying for my job. I had no brand, I had no business. I just said, I'm an actuary, I'm one guy with a bare bones website, yet I had really qualified resumes coming in the door um, to join my team, and it was a diverse profile. And you know, we hear a lot about struggles with established businesses trying to create diversity programs, and I'm not talking about diversity programs, I just think, it's a byproduct of having a well-managed company that's gonna hire good people. And I think you'll see that, and the time to do that is the beginning. It gets harder and harder if you start hiring your friends right away when you first start. And I'm not, we're not gonna get into it 100%, but you know, there's been a lot out there that shows that more diverse teams perform better, they're more creative, they create better results, and you're gonna have this if you start out this way. Yeah, and I just wanted to say, so when you start off the beginning, if you hire your friends, you're going to already have like this little tight-knit culture. You're like, a, it's like an inside joke. And people are going to be able to read that immediately when you try to hire them. So if you're, you know, have your friend and they're part of like hiring you, it's, it, it's going to feel like there's already something established. And so it, you, you, even your website, even the, the communications you put out in your job posting are all going to be catered to that perspective. So like Kyle said, it's just so important to start from the beginning instead of try to scramble later on and, and create diversity programs. So if you just start off, don't hire your friends, you'll, you'll be much better off. And your culture is gonna be sustainable. And by culture, I mean the behavior of your company. How your culture is how your people are gonna behave. And that's really important because if you start to grow and you get to maybe the spot that I'm at right now, I've got about 15 employees, your next round, you're gonna to get to the point where you can't train your own people anymore and your people who you've hired are gonna train your next round. And you, don't, you start to lose control over how that's gonna be. So the time, your, your culture is not sustainable if you've got people who have come in for you, they come in for the mission, they understand what you're doing and that's the reason they're here, that's the entire context of your relationship, they're gonna raise the next crop better and you're not gonna have your hands on that all the time. This is a more sustainable culture than otherwise. Yeah, I think you're, you know, you're kind of referring to the fact that you know, people are, you, you're saying like they're coming for you, but as you grow bigger, they're gonna get away from you. So if it's your friends and your family, they're, they're gonna be like, why am I even doing this if I'm not near the person that I care about? Because again, they're not maybe as plugged into the services. They're kind of, it may just have felt like a club before. And so, yeah. Cool. So how to get more and better business. This is our second of the three points here. And I really, for both of us, I think there's only one lesson here that is your niche. And I think that for most businesses, and this is true for both of us, it's scary to dig even deeper into your niche, but I can almost guarantee most businesses that I see in all the work that we do, you aren't digging, you aren't being specific enough about what you're selling. It's just go deeper into the niche. And I'm gonna just jump ahead to both of our own examples here. When I took over my business at Canary, an actuarial consulting firm, and I don't know if you can read all this stuff, but I'll just read it off. There's a whole suite of services that any of my competitors are gonna offer in a firm like this. Predictive analytics, liability, capital management, I don't even know what half the stuff is anymore. Financial reporting, reinsurance, reserving, these are all things, and I was terrified to get rid of some of these things, because I would actually have clients reach out to me for some of these services. One thing we did early on, we, we threw almost all of it away. I mean, you have a similar situation on your hide if you want to talk about POV. Yeah, I mean, you know, these are kind of the commonly list um, items for like, if you have the state board in cosmetology, there's just like a whole list of things that are offered. They learn, you know, stylists will learn about hair coloring and, you know, hair additions, chemical reaction, permanent way. I mean, there's so many different things. And to be frank with my business, you know, I, I kind of throw all that away 
and even a lot of stylists aren't completely fully trained in, in natural hair specifically. So they, you know, they're gonna throw away probably 95% of what they learned in school. And so, yeah, so I got very specific. So this is the list of what we actually do now. Um, the, I'm a product development firm. We're not an actuarial services firm, we're an insurance product development firm. This may not mean anything, you know, most folks here probably aren't in insurance, but that was something that was a little scary to jump into and a little different than what most of our competitors were offering. Um, similarly, you're offering national hairstyling. And, well, and then here's how we position our companies, but yours up there. Yeah, so, you know, all my visuals, all my graphics are, you know, right when you get to my website, I make it pretty clear and evident of what we do and what our focus is on. Um, so for me, you know, I think there was always that temptation to, oh, well, if you do this, can you, can you also do blowouts or, or silk press? And I think my biggest thing was convincing my team that for us, we needed to focus on our niche and develop that. And any time that we spent away from doing the things that we're focused on was time away building our skills and, and our expertise. Like we, a lot of our clients love that this is what we see every day in and out of the door. Like there's people that still look at us and say, oh, you've never seen like hair like mine or you've never, it's like, oh, actually, you know, we have, because that's all we do. We do it constantly and consistently. And I, and I assume it's the same for you. You just, you're the expert. Yeah, what we do, Canary is a lean insurance product development firm focused on bringing profitable property and casualty insurance products to market. That's what we do. And again, another comment on niche is that, you know, customers aren't looking at that whole suite of services I showed before. Customers aren't looking for a suite of services. Nobody's looking for that. They're looking for one thing. They may need a bunch of stuff at, at some time, but when they're reaching you, they're only looking for one thing. So you want to catch them at the most valuable moment for the one thing that they're looking for. You may end up delivering other service to them, or maybe not, but you got to catch them at that one thing they're looking for in that one moment. And for me, it was insurance product development. And we work with a lot of startups now, which is not something that actuarial firms normally do. But they're the people who need new products developed, and they find us through this. Um, there's a lot of challenges with developing your niche. Uh, maybe you can probably speak to this most. You got to turn away customers, which is painful. Uh, yeah, it's it can be really hard, and I'm still kind of working on it. You know, uh, you, I think there's other things that people are, are drawn to and attracted to for our salon. You know, our location is great. Um, you know, I, our, our, our staff is amazing. It's just that we just don't do certain things. And so we're still trying to develop ways to, you know, gracefully and kindly say, no, we don't do that. You know, no one wants to hear no, they, they want to hear yes. So figuring out ways to, to find a way to say, uh, yes, we can help you, but in not here. <laughs> yeah, and that leads to the second point. Finding partners is something you have to do if you're developing a niche. You want to help your clients, even though you only do one thing. You want to help them with whatever they're looking for, and they're going to end up turning to you for a lot of things once you've got this sales channel that, that is just this niche that they're coming to you for. So you want to find partners that can solve their problems, and that's where the community and the participating in events like this and meeting people, having a lot of cross-sales channels with other people who do work, a lot of this, and this is sort of next step, but a lot of this will learn, when you see people offering a lot of services, it's often a partner network. Sometimes there's merger activity between those partner networks, depending on who has the most profitable sales channel. But finding partners is absolutely key. For me, we're growing so fast, we have partners that even do the exact niche that we're doing, which is also a thing that you'll need partners for, because you'll need a button to press sometimes when you're just going through scale. Um, so doing your own things are the things that you can't, that you can't um, do. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's like who you see as your competitor might end up being a great partnership, someone you can really hand off different work to. And, and I definitely found that true of what we do is that having a, a partner salon where I can say, oh, I can help you and I can send you over here. They're really great. And we've, um, you know, we know them and have a relationship with them. So everyone's happy. This one's troubling for me, convincing your talent. So Bethany alluded to this a little bit, but when you're in a niche, the people who are applying to work for you and the people who can help you are gonna have a lot more skills than what you're advertising on your, for your company. And for me, the people who apply to an actuarial firm are gonna be really math heavy, they're gonna be really statistics oriented, they're gonna come in with a lot of skills, they're gonna predictive analytics, they're gonna be ready to really use their chops. And the first thing we tell people in interviews is, hey listen, you're a math major, you're not really gonna use math at this job. Um, we're gonna do a lot of different things and we're gonna teach you maybe 10% of the time you're gonna be using a lot of the skills. And this is probably true of any job, but 
it might scare people away when you're saying, hey, listen, we're training you to do something that isn't even something that you learn. We're gonna probably take a bunch of your skills that you're ready to go, and you might have a competitor or somebody who is more generic in your industry who is saying, hey, come in and do everything. They're not gonna be as successful in the sales process because they're trying to sell too many things at once, but the, the double-edged sword of that is that your people are gonna see that, and you really need to convince them that, hey, we're doing something special, this is a unique skill, and you're gonna have to relearn a lot of stuff. And you run into this too with the salon stylist. Yeah, absolutely. But what, what I was also going to kind of piggyback off of is that honestly, at this point, we're getting to the point where like m my stylist wants to get even more niche. There's things she's already discovered, like I don't really want to do this part of it or, you know, so I think, yeah, it may be hard to establish, but I think once you get into that kind of uh, routine and, and, and get on a roll that you might find that people even get even more specific. Cause I think there's something comforting about I know what I'm doing, I'm really good at this, I'm an expert at this, because you're gonna get different clients, so that always presents different challenges. So, you know, I think that's always a, a valuable thing to, to add. And the last piece here is developing training programs. So when you start digging into your niche, you're gonna be looked at the unique expert in that thing that you do. That's how you're gonna get business. The problem is once you start to scale, you're bringing in people who've never done this before, and you have to teach them how to do it. So how are you gonna maintain that system of, hey, listen, we're the only people who do this, we're amazing at it, yet you just have to bring anybody in to come do it. Your training programs need to be really good. And we're not gonna talk about every single thing about a training program, but that's just a challenge. You have to have a really efficient and unique way. Culture comes into it too, because you have your people ready to spread the mission. But your training program is definitely a challenge that you need so you can maintain that credibility for being the expert at the niche that you're in. You're the only one who does it. Yeah, definitely, uh, I would say, Make sure you're paying attention whenever you have successes and writing them down. You know, it's going to be hard to sometimes like look back, but I know for me something that's worked really well is like when something's worked, I'm, I make it a point to put it down in a document. You know, trying to create like a guide or a handbook about you know whether we move more into internships or apprenticeships. Um, you know, always keeping that in mind. Like, okay, this worked. Okay, cool. So this is our last topic: how to get the most from your team. So there's a lot of management books out there. I would just say like read a management book. This is just a cite, this is a citation. I think that a well-managed company, I really like some, a book that, this is a book that I like a lot. It's called The Multiplier Effect of Inclusion. It's a management book in disguise. It's a book about inclusion. If anybody's looking at diversity and inclusion, just in general, this is the only book that I actually like on the topic. There aren't really, it's just sort of a, a field that is sort of new. Um, I do recommend it. Um, but it really is a list of things that I believe are good management principles that I'm going to use as a framework for the next slide. In this book, they talk about seven skills for creating an inclusive culture. Curiosity, taking on a challenge, communication and transparency, being a change agent, so stat challenging status quo, which is a little bit along the first two, collaboration, giving credit, and consistency. And when you read a book, when they have a list of stuff like this, you're like, cool, I'm going to keep those in mind, but what do you do with that? So, I've, we've got two things that we put in place that I believe cover what will give you a well-managed company like this. And the first is build a trust system. I, I don't think I've ever said this. I've got some of my employees here in the front. But I don't say trust me. Trust me is a thing that, you know, oh, trust me, this is going to be all right. I, don't let your people trust you. Like, they should trust the system that you put into place as far as how they're being treated. Um, and consistency and communication, I believe, are the two points that we hit here. One of the things that we do, we do performance reviews every six months. And in the six months prior to that, I say, hey, here's how performance is gonna be measured. We're a growing company, so that's just gonna change all the time. When it comes to the review, you're probably gonna find out like, hey, that wasn't a very good measure of performance. We need to change the game. And one thing that we do is, it doesn't matter, this is what we agreed on six months ago, we'll change the target next month, but I'm not, we're not gonna change the game right here when we're sitting down. So communication and consistency, build a system that can be trusted by the people, don't put people in a position where they have to trust you. You just have to explain what is happening, extremely transparent. We put as many of our finances completely on the table when we talk about performance and how we're treating each other on the team here. Do you have anything more? Yeah, I want to jump in about, you know, sharing, you mentioned sharing like financially and where you're at. And I think, um, you know, I, I consider my, you know, a small business, right? And I think there's a, a, a temptation to not be as transparent as possible of what your books are with your your staff and employees, but I am completely transparent. I'm like, this is how much I spend on this renovation. This is how much money I'm spending. This is my, you know, these are my expenses. And I just share that readily to, to every staff person I've ever had. 
And I think that gives him a really good perspective on where I'm coming from and, you know, as far as, you know, compensation and pay and, you know, even with stylists too, there's, there's, a, there's a culture like I, you know, work with commission and paid salary and, and you know, stylists have been burned historically by, you know, it, 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 salons that they're commission based, but are they like a landlord? They do some booth rent and it's kind of complicated. So I think by providing a lot of transparency on my book, they, they know exactly what's happening, what's going in and out. And that creates a, such a open communication that if I need to go to them and just talk candidly about where we're at or, you know, as far as hiring a new stylist or where we're going in the future, it's so much easier. So I think as a small business, just, just, just share it. Don't be so guarded. Don't be so like, oh, it's a secret or I'm worried that they're going to go share it with someone. You should have a team that you trust and, and you just have to, you have to just open the, open the door to that. The second thing is, let your people do what they want. I don't totally know what that means, actually. But <laughs> let your people do what they want. Just be a little bit more uncomfortable you know, with things that push outside your comfort zone, which I just think hits everything else that I had on this list. So you know, your curiosity and your change and challenging the status quo. Um, your people, again, if they're mission driven and you didn't hire your friends, they're gonna come with you with ideas that you haven't heard of or you might think are weird or you have no idea how that would be successful at all. And I've got, you've got something, but I've got two examples here of things that were very successful in my business. Um, this is part of a moving video on my website. I just captured one piece of it. But one thing that I did, I had a member of my team who was pretty connected with the local art community. And we were just chatting, and I forget how it even came up, but I was like, I need to put some stuff on the walls. And she was like, well, I have a lot of artist friends. Why don't we just have some rotating thing where we put art on the walls? And this actually wasn't scary. There's no really cost to do this other than we did pay people to have the art up there. So we said, yeah, let's fill it up. Let's do a couple rotations. We've done three of them now. We've had local artists come in. And the additional thing we did was we put a spot on our website. So if you go to Canary's website, there's a whole spot that just says art in office. So our clients are going up there. They can see a section of our website that just has all of the artists, their profiles are there. They're, they're linked to their work all on our website, just like they're part of our team. We've got our team and then we've got the artists. And I was like, yeah, we'll give them some credit. It'll give us some goodwill in the local community. What I didn't expect it would do is that our interns and applicants, that's the first thing a lot of our highest qualified people who applied for the job talked about, said, we, I'm applying for a lot of different insurance companies and this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. What is that? <laughs> and it got a lot of interest. And, these, and again, these were some of the most, we were seeing more qualified resumes than we had seen period prior to this. So did not expect that at all. Did you want to say something about I, that? I just want to say, it kind of made you more competitive. It made people more attracted to you. They were picking you over more established businesses. I remember that. Like they were like, they had a lot of opportunities and they were picking you because of this art display. Like I, I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, one other example here. We did this open house. I know, Steve, you know this one. <laughs> so we had an open house and we were w working with another local uh, business owner who was doing a lot of different things. We were kicking around ideas. And I said, one of my team, let's figure something out. Let's find some way to work with this person. And um, she was like, all right, well, we're going to do an open house for Canary. I mean, we only have like 10 employees. We're going to do a virtual open house with Zoom. Let's do some videos of you talking. And then we're going to invite people to come into the office and we'll have food. I, I was like super embarrassed and shy to do this. Like, we're a small company. Why would anybody care? Um, but let's just do it. It's fine. Well, it can't hurt. Um, well, long story short, we ended up hiring. Uh, we had people come up. We had highly qualified people coming up. We hired our most experienced person uh, who, who, had, who had ever hired in the history of the company, 20 years of experience in insurance, and I had no idea that was going to happen. So we had a little open house, um, and it turned out really well. And I did not expect that. So let your people do what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I don't know. I just want to... I, I, I just remember I was I came to that event and just to sing the praises of the the people you know credit to Dana and it was Christine is that right uh, Christine who did that um, I, I remember some of the reactions was they it, it it gave an applicant a chance to meet the staff and really get a sense of the culture that was at the company I mean it was such a, a neat way to do a job interview that was more open ended and I think like more relaxed I, I mean I. I, you know, brought our kids, so it was just kind of like a, a very friendly environment, and you really got a sense of who who works there and what they did. So that was really it's like a one-on-one -on -one plus a panel interview without the weirdness of a panel interview. Everyone got to meet everybody. So yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then you had you have something. 
Yeah, um, so, you know, I had a, an amazing um, boutique coordinator, um, Dana, and she was involved with, you know, theater and performances, and, and um, you know, one of the events that she wanted to do was, um, and she still has a collective for that. She actually has her own collective. It's called Scripted in Black, so full credit to her. And she wanted to bring, like, a, a performances and dance into the space. And you can see the space in the middle on this picture, and it's pretty small, but we made it work. We pulled, you know, moved the couch back and put some other benches in there and performed right in the counter, or like up in front of the counter and, you know, poetry. And it was so, like, awesome and, uh, and amazing. And it wasn't something that I would ever, I, I don't have a background in that at all. I went to school in the business school. I'm not an artistic person, but just giving her the freedom to just, you know, here, use the space. I have this space, let's use it. And, and activating it in a unique way. We've also done yoga in our space too, which I, I, you know, it's a small space. Again, I didn't know that would work in the space, but we, we made it work. And of course, that's all just community building and, and people remember that. They always remember their experiences. And so they, of course they share it about me. And then from there, people continue to follow our journey and, you know, oh, now you're a salon. I remember when I did yoga in your space on St. Clair Street, so. And that's it. <laughs> so. Any uh, questions for our panelists? Raise your hand and I'll run you a mic and I will try not to break anything while I do it. So when you first got your couple, uh, your first couple employees, um, and it was kind of, I guess, a smaller team, obviously, at the beginning, how did you still instill that culture right at the beginning without just seeming too, uh, I guess, like in your employee space when it's just one-on-one -on -one and there's only two people really in the company at that point, or a couple people? How did we instill culture at the very early stage without being too forceful about it? Yep, exactly. Um, I didn't do anything. I think that is, but let your people, I mean, I don't, maybe that's a flippant response, but I don't think that, I, I had a lot of time, read a lot of books, I like to read books, and I would always read something in a book that was like, oh, here's an idea about what a good culture is like, and I'm just like, I, I just, resisting doing stuff that seemed cool, I think was probably the best thing I did, which is like not doing something, so letting people just kind of, you know, live their life and see where, the, see where it goes, it took a lot of years, I mean, especially when you're not hiring your friends, I mean, it's a slow burn. So like just seeing what people are like and just letting them kind of develop as time goes on, it, it kind of took its own life. Uh, I just want to, I, my comment is like, you know, I think you have to let, in those early stages, you have to let those people own the space a little bit. Like, you have to let them kind of do some things. And you're, st and, and it's early stage, so you're still figuring out things too. So I, I think, you know, but as far as your, qu your question about like, if it was like, you know, outside the box or affected business, like clients or, you know, you do have to address those, you know, that's, it's, it can be really awkward. But I think I only got a hard line when it was like, especially for me, we're client facing. So if it was something where, you know, it's like, okay, are you being rude to a client or a customer, which it has a huge ripple effect in a small local community? Um, you know, we'd, we'd tackle that. But I think for culture, you know, I, I think you're figuring out a lot of things. So I, I don't think you should be so hard on like, oh, I'm gonna have like, you know, staff lunches or happy hours all the time. I mean, you may have someone that doesn't like to drink or like, you know, so don't come in there thinking like, I, I need to do these, you know, pre-designated, uh, staff social events. I think kind of ask and be open in it and see what they want to do. You know, just having conversations. You're spending a lot of time with this person. Like you're, <laughs> you're gonna have some casual conversation and learn a bit about them. Be sure to be listening and make points. When people tell you things, they're, that's, they're telling you what, what's important to them. So I think building that into what you're establishing is really important. Yeah, and as far as the being aggressive of like what is or isn't okay, I think it's just basic behavior that you would with and like if people are talking trash about each other, I mean, that doesn't really happen at this point. And it doesn't happen with two because there's no, there's no third person. So like, 
you might notice it happens with three or four, but it's just, there's no like, this is just our culture. It's generally stuff that wouldn't be okay anywhere. Definitely lead by example too. Don't you know? Don't gossip. Maybe to you know, because then that you, if you start gossiping about even you know your personal life, that could create that. So you have to be mindful too of just how you engage and interact. Hi there, um, Brett Ewing with Axe AI. Um, so I want to I want to understand what your take might be on this because I was very similar to your. Um, whole thesis, like, do not hire your friends. That sounds like a horrible idea. And I strongly stuck to that until I started to ask the question of, what was that friendship based on? And that's when I started to change my understanding of whether or not I should hire a friend. Granted, I've only done it once, so let's not act like this it happens all the time. But um, I've found if, if the foundation of your friendship is based in, let's say, you guys you guys are into a clothing line or something like that, you guys met at a knitting circle, you guys hold yourselves accountable together, you improve together, or maybe you guys met at CrossFit, and it's a, it's a situation where your friendship is based on you guys holding each other accountable, improving your skill sets, and developing as individuals. Maybe that's the type of friendship that is acceptable to bring into your, your company. What, what are your thoughts? Oh, I'll go for it. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> agree. And I think that the line between friend, I mean, this is, don't hire your friends is a, is a catchy tagline. Um, so, like, don't hire your friends. There's nuance to it, especially as you get bigger. I would say in the beginning, for me, I believe the biggest breakthroughs as far as creativity and growth, especially in the early stages, are just, like, not thinking, not just hardlining on some things. And I think you could come up with a million nuances for why this friend is okay or that friend's okay, but I find that I learn the most when I say, you know what, I don't understand, but I'm not gonna overanalyze this piece and I'm just gonna go in the other direction and see what happens. And it, it may launch into three or four failures right out the gates, uh, but I, I'm learning more as opposed. So th th there may be that, but I, in the very beginning I did, so I did hardline and it was hard. We, I mean, my team now is not even the same team as it was. We had about six or seven people, and it's totally different people now, too. So we, th there were challenges, and we did have some rotation early, even with the don't hire your friends thing. Yeah, and a really important component of don't hire your friends is, is the, the you know inclusion and, and the diversity piece. If you have clubs that you're going to, it's going to be of that same demographic. You know, I went to school for marketing, and, you know, it's like there's a Venn diagram of, like, the kind of overlap of interest that a specific type of person does or the kind of car that they own. I mean, you're probably doing things that they're just, those would probably be your friends. You're doing the same hobbies. So even though there's a foundation of, oh, we're, we did this thing again, I think to Kyle's point, yeah, you could justify anything. You could, yeah. yeah I mean, if you want to hire friends, hire friends. But I think if you really truly care about um, creating a, a, a company that is really mission driven and is inclusive, and I do think being inclusive and diversity is super core to that, and it only benefits your business and is only going to make you more money and have a better successful business. I, I think you do have to draw some lines. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah I, I didn't. I didn't have a presence in the community before I started my business either. So there may be something there. The the, the friends line gets really blurred as as you grow your reputation within the community. And you're like, how did I meet this person? You know, I've got. Every, I know a lot of people, Dayton's a small city, so you're gonna know a lot of people, especially if you're growing a business or if you've already had a business. So I didn't have that, so it was pretty clear for me how I met a person. Now it's, a, as you're bigger, like there's people who I'm very friendly with, but it's a professional relationship because I met them through work. So it gets blurred, so I, I could see that. if I, I didn't have anything in the beginning, so it was an easier line to draw. Um, I have a question about uh, growth. Um, it sounds like, Kyle, you have some growth in your company, and congrats on that. Um, you said you have about 15 employees and $2 million in revenue. Um, I assume, like, when you were just by yourself, you started hiring people to kind of take things off your plate and different roles and stuff, and you're moving things away from your plate and everything. My question is um, about the next step beyond that. Like once you hire enough of those people to start taking things, then what you want to get off your plate is like, I, I assume you were still sort of managing and for lack of a better word, floating and kind of managing each one and supervising. 
have you gotten to the point where you are now taking the next step of bringing in like a middle management layer to sort of take the management off of your plate? And my question just is, are you at that point and what, what were your feelings going into that? Because I think you know, that's like a, a whole other level. That's the next level, right? And, and Bethany, if you have that going on too, I'd be curious about your thoughts. Yeah, we do. Um, I, I always, I prefer to home grow people because I, I hire a lot of young folks just out of school who can be very easily trained to do whatever I want. Um, but they're not gonna be doing that <laughs> for maybe at least five years. Um, I'm in the spot now where I'm at, I have a few folks that have four or five years experience, although not everybody's gonna love to do that. I haven't put, we've been very involved, Bethany and I both have been very involved in the local community as far as like what we participate in with business associations or this and that, and that has given us some connections too. You know, I ended up hiring somebody who ran a restaurant that closed due to COVID and that, uh, this is Natalie from Corner Kitchen, uh, she's running, managing the business very well. It turns out that someone who's run a restaurant is a lot better at managing than I am. So I got lucky with that way. But I think that was just keeping a, a network wide open and being like, hey, I didn't put a job out saying I'm looking for someone in insurance to uh, help me manage the business. I have every single channel open all the time. So it's still going very difficult. <laughs> so, you know, getting people because you can maybe get people that are really good at managing, but then you've got really specific technical skills. Um, although I've been surprised at how fast people pick up technical skills if you have a good training program. I and mean, we can get people who have no experience in insurance up to speed within six to 12 months if they're smart. So I, I actually think finding a good manager and finding a good team fit is number one. I think people probably overestimate how important the technical skills are for the job. I think they can be taught very quickly, uh, the ceiling for technical talent. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, just reiterating the community aspect, I do think that has, we could almost do like a whole nother talk about, you know, getting engaged with the community. That's just super important to us. And, you know, Kyle finding someone that is really great in management was only because of getting involved in our local community and him getting involved with the business association and, and you know, again, broadening your view of who's the perfect fit instead of being like, you know, like you said, someone that's worked with you five years and they're great technically and they enjoy that and then they go up to management but they may not want to do that, you know? So instead you're finding someone that enjoys the as aspect of management. Yeah, the, I don't know if this is true for you if you're going through a growing business too or anybody in here, but like my, the ch I get more boring challenges that are just frustrating to be involved in, which is just financing. I mean, if you're growing all the time, you're spending one, one or two people to train where they're not productive right away and it takes a minute to train them, that doesn't cost you a ton, but you bring three or four like our bottleneck is how many people can we, we, we just need literally be constantly financing, having people come in and they don't produce until six months later. That, that's just, and this is true in the products and in professional services, but I didn't realize it was gonna be a thing in professional services until we did it. So that's a big part of the challenge too. I have a slightly off topic question. Uh, my question is, husband and wife, entrepreneurs, very different uh, market. How is that uh, as a, a, how does that affect your, your relationship? <laughs> Both of you being small business owners and uh, the challenges of that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we're, you know, I think we both have similar personalities in a sense where we've always been, I don't want to say entrepreneurial, because I don't think we ever used that word early on in our relationship, but I, I don't know. I think we've always been just, like Kyle was, you know, his background, he was um, from upstate New York, uh, spent a lot of times in like the music scene, had a band, like, you know, just always doing something and doing something really so I'm just giving some background but I was also a person that was always trying to volunteer and do clubs and so I think we kind of came together and and we really enjoy that aspect of like working as a team and you know we give each other advice on both of our businesses and we enjoy that aspect of talking about you know what are you doing and making things work and you know again like I mentioned we're really love community and that's just such a big focus for us so for us we just see our, our business as an extension of our our love for community I mean I'll, I'll be frank for me I didn't start my business because I had 
some innate like love for natural hair, even though I saw a need because when I went natural, like there was just nothing available to me that, you know, it was hard and I really wanted to connect with people because I like to learn through people and connecting with people. Um, but really, I just wanted to make people's lives better and, you know, avoid some of the challenges I had personally with natural hair and just make people feel good. And um, so for me, it was really about connection and people at, a, at, at the core. And, you know, I think we, we have that common interest. So. Yeah, I, I like being in a relationship and having this because none of the whole don't hire your friends thing. I mean, we, we weren't you know, we just met, we're not from the same background or whatever, but we met each other and we got married. And, but just having that sort of couch time, that like Netflix couch time with somebody, <laughs> and you can just shoot off unfiltered opinions like that are maybe hard to hear. Like there aren't a lot of people who are gonna give you that. Um, and th the best, this is the most unfiltered, uh, <laughs> and we, we keep our boundaries as far as the company. We each run our company our own way, but like we shoot stuff out and it's like, that, that stinks, don't do it. Like. <laughs> It's nice to have that, so I, I like that benefit. Yeah, it's really nice to have someone outside the perspective. I mean, there's just times, sometimes you're so, like again, we're niche, so I'm so in it, and sometimes I get so in it, I can't maybe look at the bigger picture, and Kyle definitely provides that for me, and gives me some of that like down to earth like advice about, okay, you're just like too, you're too caught up in this, or too frustrated by this, like, you know, do this and just, you know, walk away, you know, or something like that. Yeah, I've probably avoided a lot of really, really strange and embarrassing things I might have tried with my company without vetting it by my <laughs> wife. So I, I, I can definitely vouch for, vouch for that. <laughs> definitely have husband, wife, business partner relationship. <laughs>